is going to the voting booth and making a selection. Welcome back to another episode of The Voice. Now, as you know, for the last several weeks, we have been interviewing candidates for public office who share our values of life, religious freedom, and family. And tonight, I'm very honored to have with us my good friend, Joyce Kropick. Joyce, welcome to The Voice. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And um, Joyce is the senator for North Carolina Senate District 31, which covers most of Forsyth County and all of Davie County. The, uh, the communities in her district include Advance, Belouze Creek, Bermuda Run, Coolamy, Clemens, Kernersville, Moxville, Walkertown, and a small part of Winston-Salem. She's represented District 31 for the past three terms or six years, and she's running for re-election this year. Now, um, Joyce lives in Kernersville with her husband, Ray, and I think you've lived here over 40 years. Is that right? I have. Yeah. I have. So that's Great community. Well, good. And you've got two grown daughters. I do. Two grown daughters. One lives here and one lives in Hillsboro. That's wonderful. So plenty of time to serve as a legislator. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It is definitely a full-time job. Yeah. And where do you attend church, Joyce? First Christian Church here in Kernersville. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, um, Joyce, when you and I first met a long time ago, at least over 10 years, probably 15 years ago. Probably, yes. You were an activist and you were very involved in uh, Christian conservative issues and working hard for the state Republican Party. Um, tell me a little bit about your activism and what kind of issues you worked on. Well, you covered it pretty well. My, um, I always say I'm a Christian first and uh, then a conservative and then a Republican, so in that order. So the values that we embrace um, are Christian values and I have worked very hard for many years on the issues that were important to me and uh, important to the citizens of North Carolina. So when you were doing all this activism, Joyce, and you were really good at activism, I remember that, <laughs> did you ever think you were gonna run for public office? I Never. Mean, how did you end up in the state legislature? Never did I think. It's it's really a funny story. Um, a lot of folks had always said, you know, you're, you're so involved, you're always working on issues, why don't you run for office? I'm like, no, I just love to work getting other good candidates elected. It's not something I ever wanted to do. And um, my house rep passed away in office and I was asked to fill that seat until the election, just to hold the seat. Mm -hmm. And so I did. Um, still had no desire to run for office. It was not something that I wanted to do. Then my senator retired, and so I was asked to fill that seat. And I said, well, I'll pray about it, and I'll think about it, and I'll let you know. So I prayed for days, did not get the fire in the belly. I just did not want to do it. I told him, I said, I am so honored that you have asked me to do this, that you know, all of my good friends have asked me to do this, but I'm just not, I've prayed about it. I'm not getting the feeling that it's something that I want to do. So I'm gonna say no. Within five minutes, Congresswoman Virginia Fox called me. <laughs> She can be very persuasive. She can, I know. And this, by then, it's like 1130 <laughs> at night. Yeah. She said, I know you've been praying about it, and I know you said no, but I've been praying about it, and I got a different answer. <laughs> I, I can said, just hear Virginia hear saying me. that. Yes. And I said, Virginia, do you have a better line than I do? And she said, how in the world can you look at this and not see that God is opening these doors? Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I never even thought of it like that. So I, I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. And if it's not what you want me to do, you stop me. And I'm still there. And I know I'll be there as long as he wants me to. And as long as he has work for me to do. Well, I believe it's God, God's will for you to be there, Joyce. It's obvious because yeah. you're so effective at what you no do. No doubt it's his will because it was not something I ever would have done on my own for sure. So um, Joyce, as a state senator, what are some of the bills that were passed into law that you're proud to have brought to the General Assembly? Um, the voter ID bill, mm -hmm. which was uh, actually a constitutional amendment that the voters of North Carolina asked for and mm -hmm. wanted. Right. Um, yeah, I was actually primary sponsor on that bill, and we were so delighted when we uh, passed it finally. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the voters passed it, and we had to pass the uh, the statute and the the 
regulations and uh -huh. all of the implementation of it we had to do. And of course, then you know what happened with the court. It so, got overturned, um, right? That's right. Yes, by that's the state right. Supreme Court. That's yes. right. And we, we had hoped that the U.S. Supreme Court would hear it, but mm -hmm. um, they have made it very clear that election law was a state issue and that they will not get involved. So um, that's still there, uh, even though the voters voted to amend the Constitution as we are allowed to do. It's just crazy that it's the crazy. state Supreme Court could overturn a constitutional amendment right. like that. Right. That's why those judicial races are so important. And I just yeah. encourage everyone to make certain that they are campaigning and working for all of those good judges that we have on the, on the ballot this year. I know that you worked really hard on a bill to force insurance companies to cover autism. Right. And um, tell me just a little bit about that. That's one of the things that I'm most proud of. Uh, that bill had been... Um, had been worked on for about 10 years when I got there, trying to get that done. And the only way I think that I finally got it passed was my argument became when I learned that if you were a, a Medicaid recipient or if you were a state employee, your children were covered for autism treatment. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't go out and buy it. The people paying the bills mm -hmm. for our children to have that treatment couldn't buy it for themselves. Hmm. It was not available in North wow. Carolina. Yeah. And so uh, that seemed so unfair to me. It does. So we worked very hard just making sure everybody was aware mm -hmm. and making sure that people understood what was at stake and we finally got that done. So a couple other things I read that you had done was Bird's Law, uh, cracking down on abusive nursing home staff. Um, and, and some other legislation. Bert's story w was an amazing story. I actually met his mom mm -hmm. at, uh, at a meeting. I had gone to a meeting and she came up after the meeting and uh, said, you know, can I talk to you? And so we started talking. She told me her story. Her son had been in a group home mm -hmm. and he had been sexually abused for oh. years for years oh. and they would bring him home on weekends and he started going through the same symptoms that children do even though he was you know an adult by then yeah but um acting out bedwetting all of those things and uh, she had actually written a little book that she had put together to tell the story mm. and um I learned that there was a law that said you must report abuse in, any, in these congregate settings, mm -hmm. but there was no penalty mm -hmm. if you didn't. Wow. So even though some of the staffers had reported this abuse, mm -hmm. it never got past the director. And uh, they just covered it up. They didn't want the publicity. They didn't That's want horrible. It was horrible. And so we, uh, we put teeth in there where mm -hmm. it will be a felony if you don't report those abuses. Wow. Well, thank you for working on that. And of course, this year, you championed uh, House Bill 918, which was to amend the abuse laws in North Carolina for foster children. Right. So that um, uh, for these kids that are born into a drug addictive home where the mother is an opioid addict or right. some other drug and mm -hmm. the child is actually addicted when they're born, right. the baby can be placed in a permanent safe home sooner because our system is just losing these babies. That's they're, right. They're getting stuck in the foster care system for years. And That's right. Past the age where they're adoptable mm -hmm. in many cases, and they're bounced around from foster home to foster home, mm -hmm. from the foster home back to the mom, back and forth and back and forth. They mm -hmm. have no permanency in their life. And it's so sad to hear those stories from some of those foster families who mm -hmm. love these children and want to have them permanently, mm -hmm. and they just keep getting bounced around. And uh, that was probably yeah. one of the most contentious bills uh, I think I've ever I've ever uh, presented and <laughs> and it was shocking to me yeah it, it is was shocking. shocking I didn't that people expect would it. want these children to stay in a home like that that's right. abusive that's right yeah yeah well thank you for your work on it and I'm so sorry that the governor vetoed it like he has many bills the last four years mm -hmm. um, many good public policies that could be in effect now if the governor would just sign them into law. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep working on that too. You know, that permanent homes for, mm -hmm. for children, um, is it, we're going to keep working on that. It's so important. It's so important. The foster care system needs a lot of work. It does. And, uh, and we're going to continue to work on it. 
that so Joyce last year you were awarded our legislator of the year award for your work on the born alive abortion survivors act you championed that bill in the senate and so tell our audience what that bill would have done and what happened to it that bill um actually i had three or four pro-life bills that i filed that year mm -hmm. um we thought we'll start with the no-brainer. Yeah. We'll start with the one that nobody will object to. The easy one. <laughs> the easy one. You know, if a baby is born alive after an attempted abortion, you'll take care of it, just right. like you would any other newborn that is mm -hmm. born prematurely. Mm -hmm. um, I never, ever could have imagined the mm -hmm. opposition that that bill drew. It was shocking to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it as you know, was vetoed by the governor. We had originally two senators from the Democrat side that voted with me on the original bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, then on the veto override, um, only one stuck with us and, uh, and voted. So we were able to override it on the Senate side, but the House was not able to. That's mm -hmm. a tragedy. That is right. a tragedy. Joyce, you are the leading uh, champion for pro-life legislation in the state Senate. And uh, we just appreciate so much your work to help prevent the atrocity of abortion. That <laughs> Thank you, and I appreciate the work that you all do on this issue as well, because I couldn't do what I do without all the work that you do, so I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good. Well, I, I want to ask you a question that comes up every election cycle. You know, the press, the teachers, the teachers union, the NCAE always attack the Republican majority in the legislature by saying that you haven't funded education enough or given teachers raises. Can you tell us the truth about that? The truth about that is teacher pay was was stymied for eight years before the Republican majority came in, came in to the majority in the, in the North Carolina I legislature. I remember it. I was lobbying yeah, then. Yeah, you were lobbying then. They actually lowered teacher pay. They lowered teacher's Purdue. pay. Education funding was cut. When we came in, we immediately started increasing teacher pay because we felt that they deserved it, that it was time mm -hmm. that they started getting on a path toward, um, toward averaging the teacher pay with, uh, you know, from mm -hmm. around the country. Every single session since Republicans have been in charge, we have increased teacher pay with the exception of the last one. And we had a nice increase in there, but the governor vetoed that budget. Right. So the increase was not implemented. But teachers on the average have received $9,000 pay increase. Not many people have had a $9,000 pay increase mm -hmm. over the last eight, 10 years. Yeah. Um, and so um, their average, the average teacher salary in North Carolina is now 54,000. Mm. Uh, we're second in the Southeast. Wow. And yet we still hear that we cut funding for education. And it is simply not true. Well, it's just a lie. A lot of misinformation goes out to the education establishment. Mm -hmm. And um, they need to check the facts because uh, it's simply not true. We have increased education consistently every session with the exception of the last one because of the veto. So thank you, Governor Cooper. Yeah. Teachers do not have a raise this year. And mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. he's blaming the Republicans in the legislature. Right. Yeah, right. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> well, Senator, what are some of the other accomplishments that you're proud of that the Republican majorities have made over the last 10 years? Well, some of the things that I'm most proud of personally is all the work that we've done for children and families, mm -hmm. the foster care system. We've made a lot of changes there. Ryland's Law. Mm -hmm. um, under the leadership of Senator Tamara Barringer when she was there. Uh -huh. um, that was a great piece of legislation to open doors for foster children where they can get their driver's license. Mm -hmm. They can go spend the night with their friends, things that they were not allowed to do before. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was very proud to work on that with her. Uh, so all of the bills that we've done that had to do with children and families and um, taking care of uh, working families in North Carolina, we have uh, cut taxes. Mm -hmm. The people at the very bottom end of the income scale, uh, if you make $21,500 or less, you pay no income tax. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the people we keep hearing, uh, my opponent constantly says, tax cuts for the rich. Uh, tax cuts benefit those who pay taxes. Yeah. And most of them are not rich. Uh, most people are ordinary citizens who work very hard. Mm -hmm. And frankly, 
They know how to spend their money better than we do in Raleigh. It's not our money. It belongs to the people who earned it. Yeah. And uh, so I'm very proud of that. By doing the tax cuts, regulation reform, um, we have made North Carolina, it's been number one, two, or three for the last oh, four or five years for the best place to do uh, business in North mm -hmm. Carolina, the best place to live, the most jobs created. Yeah. Accolades just go on and on because of the because of the implementation of the reg reform and the tax cuts and the good sound policy mm -hmm. that Republicans have initiated in North Carolina has been amazing for North Carolina to watch what we've, what we've done, how revenues have increased and we've been able to do so much more, like give teachers raises. Right. One other thing, um, we owed the federal government $2.8 billion when mm -hmm. Republicans took over in the majority. Uh, we paid it back. We, we set up a plan to pay it back in six years. We mm -hmm. paid it back in 30 months. Yeah. And then we were able to pour more money into that unemployment system and we had about $4 billion in there mm -hmm. when COVID first hit. Now, those, mm -hmm. it's going to be depleted because of all the unemployment that we've been facing. But I would hate to think what North Carolina, what position we would be in had we not made those policies and made all those changes that put us financially in a good sound position. Right. And, of course, the Democrats in the legislature were adamantly opposed to all of those changes. Right. So we would not have been in this good position That's had right. they been in the majority. North Carolina is better <laughs> off than most states by far when you look at the analysis of what they're all facing because of those sound policies. You're right. Th thank you so much for your leadership there. Thank you. <laughs> um, I know you have one of the toughest Senate races in the Senate caucus, the mm -hmm. Senate Republican caucus. I do. Is the I toughest. Do. And so tell us what is so hard about this battle for, for your seat. Um, this is the t number one targeted seat. Democrats see it as their way to take over the majority. Um, the district is different. Uh, the court actually drew um, my new district. Uh, I lost a lot of the rural area, and I picked up part of East Winston, mm -hmm. so it's not as favorable to me as it was before, so it's much tougher. Uh, my opponent is um, very liberal, mm -hmm. far left liberal. She's not a middle of the road. She's very, very liberal. She's an administrator at Wake Forest University, right? She is. Uh -huh. She is an administrator. She ran for a house seat last time. Mm -hmm. Huge fundraiser, huge fundraiser. Uh, she's outraised me by a long shot, but we had um, decided when COVID hit that we were not going to do fundraising. We just didn't think it was appropriate. My opponent has been fundraising like crazy. So um, last I heard, they had spent approximately $1.4 million for a North Carolina Senate seat. That's just outrageous. I mean, that's more like a con congressional, congressional seat. seat. Yeah, some congressional um, seats don't spend that much money. And where does she get all of this money from? Um, not much from North Carolina. Most of it is coming from all over the country. Um, you know, all all mm -hmm. over. Um, not nearly. I think about eighty something percent is from other states and not North Carolina. Uh, some of the endorsements, I wanted our viewers to know, some of the endorsements that Joyce's opponent, Terry Legrand, has received are uh, Barack Obama. Um, he endorsed Terry Legrand. Mm -hmm. She's one of only 10 candidates in the state to get his endorsement. She's also been endorsed by Lillian's List, Emily's List, those are both, and Planned Parenthood, those are all extreme pro-abortion packs. She was endorsed by the Human Rights Campaign, the LGBT activist organization that bullied North Carolina so much about um, our law that protects women and girls from having men in their bathrooms and locker rooms. She's also been endorsed by the Teachers Union, the NCAE, uh, Moms Demand Action, which is an anti-gun group, and a labor union, the AFL-CIO. So, uh, all in all, she's been endorsed by 23 ultra-liberal groups, plus the ultra-liberal sheriff for Forsyth County. Wow. She's just really a who's who of liberal progressive candidates. And um, what do you think that tells about, what story does that tell about her candidacy? Um, that shows the difference in the candidates. It couldn't be more clear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are polar opposites. Uh, I'm conservative. She's very liberal. Um, and I don't think that's what the people in North Carolina want. So I think if we can um, mm -hmm. expose that record and the endorsements that she has, mm -hmm. those are not 
mainstream citizens of North Carolina that support those organizations. You're right, and especially not in your district. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Joyce, I noticed that you've received a 100% score on scorecards from the National Federation of Independent Business, uh, Grassroots North Carolina, and our organization, the NC Values Coalition. And you've also got a 91% from the American Conservative Union. So that says that you're a true conservative uh, because you've voted for conservative bills 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed that you've also been endorsed by Joel Ford, yes. a, a former Democrat in the North Carolina Senate. And I just wondered if you'd tell me about how you and Senator Ford forged a friendship that resulted in this endorsement. Oh, Joel, is he is such a godly man. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shared faith. Um, I remember calling him one day, he was driving into the Senate and I called him about an issue and uh, he immediately said, I'll call you back in a few minutes, I need to pray. Wow. And so uh, <laughs> he called me back, uh -huh. um, he co-sponsored the voter ID bill with me. Uh -huh. And um, he was just, we, we shared our faith together, <laughs> we became friends. He. Um, he was the, the most conservative of the Democrats. He was, um, he was always on the side of faith, and he faced tremendous pressure from his caucus on so many votes, and I just admired him so much for doing that, for standing up, doing what was right, and doing the, the, the godly thing mm -hmm. um, on those issues that were so tough for him to make in light of in light of the party that he was a member of. That's really wonderful, Joyce. Well, today I just want to announce that it is our high honor and privilege from the North Carolina Values Coalition to endorse Senator Kravik in her reelection bid. Thank you, Tammy. Yes, I, I can't think of anyone better who better represents biblical Christian values or has more fight in her than Joyce <laughs> Kravik. <you. laughs> and uh, we just wish you well, and uh, we hope that you win this reelection. Thank you so much. I appreciate your endorsement. I appreciate your support. You've always been a dear friend, and I just thank you for all that you do. Well, Joyce, I, I think so highly of you as a person, but also as a legislator. Later. Thank you. So thanks for running. I know it's not easy. I noticed your opponent has attracted national support from some really liberal election activist groups, um, groups like Swing Left and Every District. These are really Democrat groups that are focused on turning red states blue, like they did Virginia. And um, uh, they've gotten behind your opponent. In fact, a lot of her campaign contributions have come from out of state, as you mm -hmm. said, California, New Mexico. Texas, Washington, D.C., and she's outraged you by five to one. Uh, mm -hmm. She appears to have the full force of the progressive movement from across the country. Mm -hmm. And Joyce, we know that money doesn't always determine the outcome of an election because right. she ran last time against Representative Deborah Conrad and outraised right. her a great deal and lost. Right. So um, after all, you know, uh, money isn't everything. You have to have the values that the voters in your district want. So. Um, I just wanted to, to ask you about this funding mechanism that they all seem to be using. Um, I, I noticed Lillian's List and Emily's List send out emails across the country about mm -hmm. candidates who share their values, which mm -hmm. is pro-abortion. Mm -hmm. And then they have a link to click to right. North Carolina candidates that you can support. And she's on that page. Mm -hmm. um, Terry Legrand is one of those candidates endorsed by them. They've given money to her. And so they're using fundraising efforts all over the country to help get her elected. Mm -hmm. Right. And one thing I did want to add, too, um, you mentioned that my opponent ran for a House seat uh, mm -hmm. last time and lost and raised a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, she also has never lived in District 31. Mm -hmm. She moved here days before the filing period wow. into an apartment. Um, she actually has a home in Winston-Salem in District 32, where huh. she has always lived. And so she moved here days before the filing period just to run for this seat. And she has even admitted that in an interview with the newspaper that she moved here to run for the seat. So she's seems, not really a, a real resident of, uh, of District 31. Sounds terribly dishonest <laughs> uh, and deceptive to the voters. Uh, that's just awful. Um, but why is it so important, Joyce, from a macro level of looking at the entire state Senate for you to win this seat? Um, 
as I said, they believe that this is the seat. If they can take this seat, they're going to take the majority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whatever it takes, they're willing to do to make sure that mm -hmm. this seat is not re, does not remain uh, in Republican hands, that it is, goes to a liberal Democrat. So winning this seat could mean the difference between Republicans having the majority in the Senate or right. being in the minority. Right. And now that we've seen how liberal Governor Cooper is, losing the majority in the state Senate would just be tragic yes. for conservative yes. values. So, yes. Joyce, if people want to get involved in your campaign, if they want to give you a donation to help you win, uh, or if they want to volunteer, where should they go? Go to my website, JoyceForSenate.com. Sign up to donate whatever you can or to a volunteer for our campaign. We would love to have you there. I want to end our program tonight by asking you, what is it that motivates you as you go to that building in Raleigh every day? You have to drive an hour and a half to get there and come home. And uh, it's hard to be a legislator. You don't get paid hardly anything. And so why are you doing this? For the citizens, and it is so rewarding. The, the times that I have met with families a couple weeks ago, um, I met with a family here in my district whose son has autism. Mm -hmm. And with the schools being closed down, I've started hearing from these families that the virtual learning is not working for those oh, autistic boy. children. And so the bill that I ratified on Thursday, which I was so honored that the party allowed me to have that honor, um, had funding in there for those kids to get scholarships, mm -hmm. increasing those grants so that they'll be able to get the help that they need. You know, last Thursday, you and I were in attendance at an event uh, with Vice President Mike Pence in Raleigh, mm -hmm. the Life Wins 2020 uh, campaign. And the Vice President was speaking about his support for the pro-life movement. Right. And it was just an incredible event. Um, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest was there, and Lieutenant Governor Candidate Mark Robinson, uh, Justice Paul Newby, and five members of Congress. And um, and you made the time while session was on to come and be there for part of the event. I so appreciate that. Um, but it was it was uh, at the end of the day, it was in some ways a tragic day because uh, Planned Parenthood and the ACLU filed a major challenge to five different uh, pro-life advances that we've worked hard together to get mm -hmm. passed mm -hmm. in the last eight years. Mm -hmm. And because we have this liberal activist Supreme Court in North Carolina with six activist progressive members and one conservative. And uh, Joyce, do you think that it's possible that this case will undo a lot of the progress that we've made to advance life in North Carolina? That was a great event, Tammy. That was a great event. It was so inspiring to hear all of those candidates and those elected officials talking about mm -hmm. the pro-life movement and um, what they've been able to do as well. It was very, very encouraging. Um, I fear that, yes. I've seen what the activist courts, even when we had veto-proof majorities and we were able to override mm -hmm. vetoes, um, the court was still stopping the legislation that we were passing, mm -hmm. the will of the people. Mm -hmm. And that is why it is so important. Those judicial races are so important. They will chip away at everything that we do as long as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. It is that important to them. We Abortion to is the it. holy grail. It, uh, it is the holy grail of the liberal left. It is. Yes. And uh, they will do anything they can to make sure that abortion is front and center on their plates. And uh, we've got to make certain that we do all we can to um, get rid of these activist judges so that the legislature can do the job that our constitution provides for. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you, Joyce. That was great. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> um, well, I think you can see why Joyce Krobick is one of the most effective conservative principled legislators that we have in the entire state of North Carolina. And I hope you will help her, especially if you live in her district, because she needs your help. It's a matter of keeping the majority in the state Senate this election. So if you've enjoyed tonight's program, I hope that you'll go to our website, ncvalues.org, where you can watch previous episodes of The Voice and join us again next Wednesday night at 730 for our next episode. Thank you and good night. 
Which of these issues do you care about? What if you could influence how they were legislated? What if you could impact the outcome of the next election? What if you could change the course of America?